Okay. Maybe you shouldn't say that about a 17-year-old, but again, he is in the arena. And then he calls for a boycott of her sponsors. Now, what, what is... Really? Is that American? To call for yeah, a... Yeah, really? Yeah, that, 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 let, let me explain something. Uh, I told, because I, I, I don't I, think... I, and he complains about bullying. That's listen, bullying. I, I have been the victim you. of a boycott. I, look, I, I, agree I lost with a you. job once. It is wrong. You shouldn't be, do this by team. You should do it by principle. I agree. But, but, but. <laughs> well, that was interesting. That was uh, Bill Maher's was it HBO show, Real Time with Bill Maher. And believe me, he said a lot of nasty things about me. But on this issue about the boycotts and, you know, someone says he whined and then I say I apologize and then that's not enough. And then you got to shut down speech. My point is that when you really get to the bottom of all this, uh, this is about trying desperately to silence conservative voices. If you're an effective conservative voice, the left doesn't really want a debate. They don't, they don't want a debate. They don't want you to speak on college campuses. They want to deprive you of your right to speak. And if that means, you know, getting a George Soros funded organization to put muscle behind an effort to silence you or attack your advertising, they'll do that. This is all part of the part of the game for them. But, you know, I I think debating these issues of the future of America, of the First Amendment, what our framers set up in our constitutional republic, what is liberty today? Liberty without virtue. What does it mean? How about our relationship with China. How about getting involved in Syria? Are these issues not important to discuss and to debate? The Second Amendment, very important to discuss and debate. But look, if you dish it out, you have to be able to take it. And, you know, I, you know, I can dish it out and I have to be able to take it. And, you know, but, but being a target of boycotts, I mean, I've never been a fan of boycotts. I just not my thing. Never been a fan of them. And I'm not saying people don't have the right. They can buy any product they want or not buy any product they want. But I personally think the debate on the issues are what's much, much more important. That's why I, you know, when uh, Ed Schultz, remember when Ed Schultz called me the S-L-U-T word? Why? He, call, he calls me a, you know, I guess he called me a slut, if my, if my memory serves me right. And people were like, let's boycott. I, had, I wasn't for boycotting him. I accepted his apology. I don't have time for this. This is ridiculous. And that was pretty um that was that was fun. I remember I was doing my uh audio book. I think I was doing the audio book for the Obama diaries. That's what it was. It was audio book for the Obama diaries and I started getting pinged on on my text messages one after the other after the other. Do you hear what Ed Ed Schultz said about you? He's called you a slut. I guess it was on his radio show. Then he wanted me to come on his show so he could apologize. I said, no, I accept your apology. I don't, you know, I don't agree with Ed Schultz on a lot of things, but I didn't think he should be thrown off the air. He made a mistake. It's ridiculous. And that's why, I, remember when poor Lawrence O'Donnell was caught, you know, it happened to me once. You're caught, someone's recording you and you're in the studio and he was complaining about noise or something. It's like, okay, give it. Until you sit in that chair, you don't know what it's like. Okay, so yeah, you know, everybody makes mistakes. Not a big deal. I'd rather debate on the substance. I defended Lawrence O'Donnell. Oh, he defended me, right? Ah, that's funny. Of course he didn't. But that's just where I come from on these issues. Joining us now is Victor Davis Hanson. A lot, lot to talk to him about, but we're going to start on this topic. It was interesting to have Bill Maher, who is a avowed liberal, someone I used to know pretty well when I used to go on Politically Incorrect all those years ago. He despises me and my political views, but he's against these boycotts because he thinks they're, they're cudgels to avoid debates on critical issues and to silence voices of opposition. Uh, Victor Davis Hansen joins us now. VDH, how are you? Good to talk to you. Thank you for having me, Laura. Now, what do you think about that whole uh, deal and unlikely allies and uh, and uh, Bill Maher there? Well, I think everybody who writes or has a show like you or just writes a column, we like we're kind of in an internet electronic global guillotine. So one false slip and this mob comes out of the you know the woodwork, sort of like the French Revolution, and they they think that they're perfect because they have no accountability and anybody who's 
good but not perfect they feel it should be beheaded and then because of the mass mobilization that they have access to twitter facebook google whatever email they can destroy people's lives and then they have no consequences so when they do certain things and they hurt people and that's one issue but the other is that they they judge a person's entire body of work on one pull quote or one statement and then that becomes an epitome of everything you've ever done in your life and yet they never would apply those rules to themselves so because they're anonymous in a way so i think it's dangerous and i think when we're seeing a pushback against facebook or a high tech or this this sort of assassination of public figures who drive by shootings I, i think people are rebelling against it and that's why you probably have allies on both sides yeah i mean it's interesting i was away with my kids because it's their only week off for six months which is so we decided to go south and people are like well you're forced off the air and i was actually thinking of coming back just because i want to just make all those people look like fools however on the other hand i was like well now i'm just gonna do i'm gonna do what i always do these people, it's just hilarious because it's just like it's just like it was in the 80s, except worse, because we have social media, uh, Victor. Yeah, and it is. the speech codes of the 80s applied to conservative students on campus back then. Now we see those students who were in school in the 80s. Now they're running corporations. They're running. They're they're running media companies, and so it's the same old game: silent speech, demonize individuals, isolate them, demonize them. And these these corporations just start buckling because they get a hundred a hundred emails of people complaining. Uh, people don't even buy their products anyway. Instead of saying, "Look, you know, we're not in the business of content discrimination," and you know, people apologize. And I think there is, on. though. Don't you think? I think there's a revolt, a, a pushback against it. People are getting tired of it because it's not it's not even coherent. And the design of it is. Two weeks from now, nobody will know that this happened. But their point is they want to keep doing it sort of like tapping a little eggshell. And we forget each tap, and then suddenly they hope the person implodes under what they call an avalanche of collective scandal. But I think people are kind of getting tired of it, and they're saying, you know what? You, you, what are the rules? What are the rules? So what can you say? And what? Because I know that people are helping you from the left, but really the, it, it's asymmetrical. Because people on the left say things that would get them fired in two seconds uh, from their, and we don't want to do that on the conservative side. So we're playing sort of with one hand tied behind our back, and when this happens, we count on the magnanimity of a few people on the left to say this could happen to me or this isn't symmetrical. But generally, in, in within general terms, the people on the right are live and let live. And they don't organize like this. Sometimes they do, but not like this. This is sort of a holistic French revolutionary. We're going to demand, uh, you know, a holistic act. Everybody's life is going to be politicized. Everything you do is going to be politics, from sports to advertising to TV, everything. And that's, I think it's really scary. It's a totalitarian enterprise, and it's fueled, as you said, by the Internet. And we have to speak up against it or yeah. it's just going to continue. And I think consumers are doing that. They're, I, I guess my staff sent me a lot of links of big efforts from conservatives to tell these companies, you, you drop the show and we're never going to buy your product again. We, we can do We have power, too. And just they don't want to do that. Yeah. But it's like, look, look, we're not we can't fight no, with one no hand. Type. We can't do it. I mean, and, they, and meanwhile, they're rewarding companies that stand by. Uh, my show, and I, you know, I want every company to advertise with us because we're doing really well, and we have great staff, and we, you know, we are really pushing for a better America, and not we're not perfect, we make mistakes, but who doesn't? Uh, and uh, well, I make mistakes. Everybody's subject to it. Yeah, everybody's subject to it because if I write a critical thing about big tech, oh. you no know, sooner have I written it, and somebody whispers and says, you know, this person gives to the Hoover Institution, and they don't like what you write because they're financing Facebook or they're invested mm. with Google. But everybody faces it, and it's kind of scary because of the power that they can galvanize in a, in a minute, and they're not accountable. And, so, and conservatives have to do the same no. thing in response. I mean, you can't. It's, it's yeah. can't be unilateral disarmament. No way. That just that just no, doesn't work. No. Uh, speaking it of speaking of work. arms, Victor, I have to ask you about the Syria uh, intervention yeah. because. 
you and I have gone around and around on this over the years. And, you know, I was a Reagan conservative, worked in the Reagan administration. I'm all about peace through strength, the strong military, but our economy and our borders, our culture, uh, all of it has to be sacrosanct and protected as well. And now we're, I guess, seeing the president urged by a lot of neoconservatives to launch military strikes again in Syria because of this uh, this uh, chemical attack that happened, 40 people apparently dead, uh, horrific stuff. Uh, what next for the Trump administration and how might this change the viewpoint that a lot of people had about him as a non-interventionist? Well, he's got a, there's some contradictions that were never resolved uh, about his view of deterrence because he said he was going to bomb the FH out of ISIS, and he did. And yet he said he wasn't going to waste these endless wars, which he hasn't so far. But that to he's got to really thread that needle, and that means to create deterrence and to make sure that people don't do stupid stuff, every once in a while you have to show that it's not just Twitter or, and you have to follow your word or you end up like Obama with a red line. On the other hand, if you do it too much, then you're just constantly you know, doing what Trump said was a waste of time and a stupid uh, waste of our resources that could have been spent at home. So I think what he's trying to do is, is there a way to do this and restore deterrence so we get a stable foreign policy, but I don't have to put troops on the ground or I don't have to make these trillion-dollar commitments. And that's going to be very hard to do because we've never really resolved that. Uh, I think people agreed with Trump. We don't want to go into an Afghanistan. We're, we're not tired of that. And that's what he won on, in part, in part. On the other hand, the media shows pictures of people being gassed, and they see that Trump destroyed ISIS, and they said, well, why can't we do that? And then if he says, well, I don't know, but he tweets and says this is going to stop, then he's going to have to follow through because what the common denominator in all of this we lost deterrence even as we were involved under bush and uh, obama we spent money everywhere but we didn't create the image that's stupid to try to test the united states trump came in and said i'm not going to be so promiscuous force but it's going to be stupid to test the united states because i'm going to react but i'm going to react in a way that's in our interest so we're going to have to see how that plays out. It's very difficult to restore deterrence once it's been Yeah, lost. I mean, I, but you have Lindsey Graham out there, uh, and he's out there, oh, we've no, got to I, set up I, safe zones, we got to get patrol. The, 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 okay, okay, where's this international institutions we keep hearing about? Well, I mean, if, if, if this is a humanitarian crisis, and it, and it has been, had hundreds of thousands of killed in this civil war, humanitarian crisis, where's the international community? Well, where, where are they? No, are they ponying up money? No, it, no, I don't think there's any support. If Trump goes into Syria and sends 10,000 or whatever he's going to do or does any of the things you mentioned, he's going to lose his base, and he should because he said he wasn't going to do that. So he, what he's trying to figure out when he tweets and says, you know, unacceptable, it can't happen, does that mean that he can send 20 cruise missiles in and not get involved and just blow up some stuff? And to say, what well, end? Yeah. Doing this, or, it, it doesn't, it doesn't yeah. accomplish and, anything. It's Russia and Iran is backing Assad. This is, so we're gonna we're yeah. gonna get into a war with Russia over Syria. I mean, I. <laughs> well, you see what I'm saying though yeah. is that when you say you're going to do this stuff, then you have to either do the stuff or not say you're going to do it. Otherwise, you're back to the Obama paradigm. Right. And then the red people line. will start doing a lot of stuff. They'll start doing a lot. The reason they're doing this stuff is they think, well, we got it. You know, we had the Spratly Islands when we were the Chinese. We had the red line with this, and we had the Iran giveaway deal, and we and. North Korea said, you know, look at Obama didn't do anything. We can yell. And then Trump came in, came in and said, this is over. You can't take advantage of the United States. And now people are saying, OK, what are you going to do? And he's kind of sort he's, of in, he's stuck he's now once of, you start tweeting that stuff. Uh, Victor Davis Hanson, it is fabulous always to have you on. Phenomenal voice of reason on our Constitution, our First Amendment rights military intervention, China, and the rest. We've talked to you for an hour. Thank you so much. We'll take a break. Close out this hour. We are on tap for a lot more. The Twitter CEO now uh, favoring a, a new civil war in the United States. Fantastic. The Laura Ingram Show. 